Okay, Doc, you're on. Uh, recently, my doctor switched from using test sip, 200 megs once weekly, to having me use trochies of test, 30 milligrams, uh, two times a day. My question is, what's more effective, and should I ask to get my injection back instead of uh, trochies? That's a good question. This is, uh, well, this one's an easy one as far as I'm concerned. Um, we definitely want to use an injectable over an oral simply because you're making your liver do more work if it passes through the GI. You're going to get metabolites of testosterone formed before the, you know, or as part of the first pass, we call it. If you inject intramuscularly, that testosterone can circulate before it passes through the portal vein, you know, the liver and gets then. Start, it starts to get broken down okay. and metabolized into things that we may or may not want, obviously. Uh, so that one's, man, I mean, that, this is a short one. Um, I don't know what the rationale would be for using a trochee, uh, anything oral over an injectable. Uh, this question comes up with people who are a little bit averse to using an injectable over, say, a cream, which, again... Um, is comparable in the sense that it bypasses that first pass of the liver uh, deal with an oral. Um, but the problem with whether it's oral or transdermal, aside from the liver, is that there's a reason why you have to take them every day because your testosterone levels are going up and down. This is not an, a, a time-release form of testosterone like cypionate is. An ester of testosterone, the beauty of it is you only, gotta, you only have to inject yourself once a week. And yes, you have a little bit of a, 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 a zenith and a, a nadir, <clears throat> going back to you know the SAD, SAT study courses, right? You know, a, a, a top and a bottom level, right? But I always liken it to those top and bottoms being uh, sort of like a three foot wave on a twenty foot wall of water for a guy. You're not, in other words, you're going to notice those. So enjoy the convenience of the once a week dosing, and also enjoy the clinical benefit of having your levels be high for the entire week and never dropping down to 200 nanograms per deciliter total test before you do your next application to cream or another trochee uh, and then you know bring you back up again you're, you're going up and down during the day and I realize again in many ways that's mother nature's way of doing it but you know I'm not going to say it again about what's normal and natural but you get my yeah. point I mean you know mother nature at least as far as we have the audacity, if you will, to think about it, is not necessarily always, you know, right according to our perspective. You know? <laughs> People definitely, clinically, in all seriousness, uh, you know, say that the injectable is so much better in terms of results and also, obviously, a lot less of a pain in the neck, uh, whether it's a, an application daily of a cream or a, or a pill. You know, it's, you don't have to remember to do it, but for once a week. Yeah, I mean, it's very good. Thank you, Doc. Off. I appreciate the time and effort in making these Ask the Doc videos. It's our pleasure, right, Dave? That's right. It's difficult enough to find a doctor that specializes in this topic of hormones and has read, you know, has the real world knowledge of what goes on behind doors in the bodybuilding sports scene. Uh, I'm not even going to say the next part because I'll blush. Uh, <laughs> in your previous video, Dr. McLean answered the question of high BP and the option of donating blood was mentioned. Donating blood frequently comes up in my bodybuilding circles. As a TRT patient, I have no problems, but what about high dosages of non-testosterone steroids? Oh, okay. Nor 9s, uh, DHTs, orals, etc. And can blood be donated even while using an aromatase inhibitor, inhibitor on your steroid cycle? Um, well... Certainly, you can donate blood whenever you want. The purpose of donating blood, um, well, it can be for, like he suggests, if the blood's too thick, it might um, raise your BP, certainly, and it's certainly not a good idea in the long haul to have thicker, uh, more viscous blood because of its effect on the left ventricle of the heart, and it's, you know, also supposedly an increased risk of stroke. Um, and I don't want 
to poo-poo that. It's just I've seen people come in with very high levels of hemoglobin and hematocrit. Uh, I have one patient who unfortunately has polycythemia rubavera, and I've seen him come in with, you know, a hemoglobin of, of 26. Um, and, of course, hematocrit's roughly three times that, so whatever that, that math comes up with. I mean, crazy numbers, and he's still alive. He's not uh, happy about having to do donate blood, but... Uh, you know, most of the people I see suffering side effects of um, blood that's too viscous will come in uh, complaining when the hemoglobin's 19, you know, and I'm just using hemoglobin because, uh, again, hematocrit's three times that, but um, typically, uh, but it really it's, it's the hematocrit that's more of an issue. Um, and, and the symptoms are usually uh, dizziness, uh, one of the classics is, uh, even when it's not that high, is you'll be sitting there and you'll take a, I call it a heavy sigh, you'll take a deep breath for no reason. Like, also, postprandial narcosis, and it's kind of counterintuitive because you'd say, well, you know, you've got all this extra hemoglobin that carries oxygen, why would you have, you know, food coma more so after you eat if you have all the extra hemoglobin? Wouldn't that cover for the, the uh, displacement of the oxygen that occurs when you, the triglycerides build up and and you, know, you go into food coma, but it's just that, yeah, but no matter what, the triglycerides are gonna knock them all off, and uh, people just tend to have more of an extreme reaction, so feel like, wow, my food coma is way worse now with, with more viscous blood. But in regards to, uh, specifically, this gentleman's question, um, there's no restriction on donating blood just because you happen to be taking uh, an aromatase inhibitor. I think that's his question. And, um, and this would be more a matter of you know, don donating to the American Red Cross. We have rules. You can't donate blood. Uh, they don't want it, and it's for good reason, so I, I don't even try and sneak it by. I'm not sure that they test for finasteride. I would think they do, but they ask you not to donate if you're taking finasteride. If they give it to a female who's pregnant, it can cause uh, really bad side effects to the fetus, teratogenic side effects, they call oh, it. Wow. Uh, you'll get really bad mutations. So, you know, wow. that we have that rule here. But you can still, you can do a therapeutic phlebotomy. You're not doting the blood. You're just getting rid of it if you need to. Again, this gentleman doesn't have a problem, uh, according to him, with uh, elevated hemoglobin hematocrit. But um, there are no issues also about uh, with donating blood, whether you're taking nandrolone or... Uh, DHT or whether it's uh, oral or um, injectable uh, yeah and he is referring to donating so the donation restrictions would really apply uh, to whatever uh, group is accepting the donations and what they're using it for but I, I, I again other than the finasteride issue and of course in this country they say if you've been to the UK in the last X number of months they're worried about the prions that might have been acquired from eating, you know, some contaminated beef and all that sort of thing. So each place and, and for each time period, um, you know, there are different rules in place. But these specifically, at least in this country, I, have, I am not aware of there are any of those being a restriction on your donating blood. And again, certainly if your levels of hemoglobin hematocrit are too high, you don't have to donate. You can just get rid of it uh, if you need to. And um, that's not an issue. Good. Thanks, Doc. Thank you, Doc.